Hi everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week, my first question comes to me from Greg Gaultier, who asks, Howdy there, Steve. Your An Atheist Reads videos are fantastic. The library keeps getting bigger and bigger, and every new series is a cornucopia of good stuff. But there is one book that's conspicuously absent from the collection. One book I keep hoping to one day see in the channel feed, but it never shows up. One book that I think would be the crown jewel in your whole series of critical readings, but also one book that I suppose is probably the most difficult to claw through, though I'm sure William Lane Craig is a close second. That book is, of course, the Bible. When will we see an atheist reads the Bible? I'm dying to see what this shive's mind has to say about it. If I did an atheist reads the Bible. I would want to focus more on the Bible as a work of literature, the Bible as, as a work of legend and mythology, and examine it that way rather than doing the typical thing that we've that a lot of people before me have done very well already, which is to, you know, read it and pick apart the uh, the, the literal interpretation, you know, talk about all the bad science and the bad history. I would want to just ignore that whole thing for my type for, for my series. And, uh, and just look at it as a book, as a work of literature, and, and analyze it that way. And I don't know how interesting that would be to people, and I don't know how good I would be at it. I think my, my insights might be rather superficial and crude, given uh, the fact that I'm not a biblical scholar, that I'm not a, a mythology scholar, etc. But nevertheless, I mean, I, I know there is some interest in it. I know of several people have asked me if, I, if I'm going to do that at some point, and I'm not going to rule it out. I, I may do it at some point. I may do a particular book of the Bible, uh, but I, I don't know when. I don't have any plans to do it right now. I, I certainly won't do it this year, uh, but we'll see. Troubleshooter 125, a serious one for you, Steve. Do you think that as Christianity continues to lose influence and power in the U.S., there is a chance of the more radical elements may start acting out more violently against the atheist community, and for that matter, any group that is non-Christian. I'm not certain myself, but a part of me has seen the potential for that for a while, especially in irrational beliefs leading to irrational behavior and Voltaire's quote about absurdities and atrocities. would very much like to hear your thoughts on this. Anything is possible. I certainly do think that the demonstrated tendency of certain types of Christians in the U.S., uh, evangelicals, p politically conservative evangelicals, uh, they have a, a very pronounced tendency to victim play, to talk about themselves and think about themselves as an oppressed minority, when in fact they're probably some of the least oppressed people in the history of humanity, uh, that tendency maybe would lend itself to violent outbursts if they ever felt truly threatened, if, if secularism and uh, atheism or non-religious ways of thinking ever truly did begin to overwhelm Christianity in terms of influence and power and, and, and uh, presence in our culture. That, I mean, it's certainly possible. I don't look for it to happen. I don't really expect it. Uh, it's not something I worry about. One of the nice things, actually, about living in a, a predominantly Christian nation as opposed to a predominantly Muslim nation in, in, in uh, the Middle East, for example, is that, relatively speaking, uh, Christianity as a whole is relatively domesticated. Uh, we have a history, we have a long tradition now here in the West, stretching back a couple of centuries, of secularism, of rationalism, of enlightenment, of uh, the church being subservient to a secular democratic state. And all of that has had a very positive effect on our religious institutions, I think, I find. Uh, so I don't think we have that kind of thing to worry about. And there doesn't seem to be that pattern of behavior, at least not as commonly uh, with Christianity as with like the, the more radical elements of, uh, of Islam. You know, rad radical Islam has to worry about people committing acts of terrorism, whereas for the most part, fundamentalist radical Christians just like to bitch about stuff and talk really horrible shit about gay people. But, but there aren't nearly as many violent outbursts. Uh, so I don't, I don't really expect that sort of thing. 
Stephen Sargent, respectfully, Steve, the problem with atheism is that it offers no hope to the bereaved. There's no chance of seeing the deceased and no purpose to the loss. A little girl who's just lost her mom deserves more than shit happens. What would you say? Even if it's a fairy tale, do you really want to take it away? Well, that's not the problem with atheism. That's the problem with reality. The problem with reality, as far as a bereaved person goes, is that you die and that's it. That there is no fairy tale happy ending. There is no afterlife. Uh, there is no paradise. There is no eternity where we will be reunited with our lost loved ones. That, that's not a problem with atheism. That's just a problem with life. And uh, what would I say to a little girl who is grappling with some devastating loss like that? I certainly wouldn't say shit happens. That's a horrible thing to say to a grieving person. I would try to comfort the person as best as I could. I would ask them to think about the good times with their mother, you know, to remember that their mother was here, that she was, hopefully if we're talking about a, a good mother, that, you know, your mother loved you, your mother cared about you, your mother uh, did everything she could for you. You were so important to her. You made her life so happy and so joyful and so filled with purpose and meaning. and and the good times you had with your mother will always be there. You will always have done those things. Um, I, but I would not lie to people, I, especially to children, especially to people who are the most vulnerable. I, it's not that I want to take that fairy tale away. I don't want to give them that fairy tale to begin with. I don't want to give them that false consolation. I think that's wicked. I think it's a horrible, horrible thing whether it's a child or whether it's a, anyone who is in that vulnerable state where they're grieving and they're hurting and they're wondering what does this all mean, why did this happen, how am I going to move forward because of this. It's a horrible thing to lie to that person and to tell them a, a, a fiction about how, oh, it's okay, you don't need to be that upset because the person you love who's dead, they're really still alive in some other place. It's a horrible thing to say to somebody. I would never say that to somebody. I find that I think that's that's cruel and wicked and evil to say that to someone. And that that's and that would be my, that's my position. Not to not so, I don't see it as taking anything away because there's nothing there. I'm not taking anything away by telling a child the truth because there's nothing there. They don't have it to begin with. It's a lie. Nathan Young, Steve, I have debated with my dad about how the story of Noah's Ark couldn't possibly have happened with the amount of water on Earth. But he says that he thinks only the known world in those days was probably flooded, not the entire planet. What do you think of this theory? I've heard it suggested that the, the origin of the flood myth comes from the fact that uh, cultures who grow up agriculturally near bodies of water like rivers or... Uh, uh, lakes that have a tendency to flood on a regular basis, that uh, the flood myth becomes a very strong part of their tradition. And in fact, flood myths are very common throughout cultures, uh, ancient cultures all over the world. It seems to be a very commonly recurring motif. Um, but every flood story is different in the details, the context is different, the, the scope of the flood is different. I think, but I think it's re not unreasonable to assume that that is sort of the germ that the Noah story grew from, uh, that there was some sort of local flood or that, that there was culturally some tradition of, of flood stories and that's where the Noah story came from. Uh, as to whether it was based on any specific actual flood, I don't know. Uh, the, uh, a flood of the entire known world which I suppose known from the perspective of the ancient Hebrews who were who were making up the story. Uh, I don't know if there ever was such a flood. 19 Flute Girl 95. Hey Steve, this is probably a weird question, but it's something I've discussed and debated with a lot of people, but never had the opinion of an atheist. I'm a Wiccan, and I know you talk about Christianity a lot and touch on some other belief systems, but I don't think you've ever touched Wicca. If you don't have much working knowledge on the subject, I would understand if you don't want to answer my question, but if you do, what are your thoughts, opinions on this particular belief system, especially since it is quite a bit different than a lot of others, and at least I feel that if you really study the fundamentals, it's based on more plausible ideas and comes across with a little more logic. Feel free to disagree, though. I won't get offended. I'm sure whatever you have to say cannot be any more offensive than the shit I already get for being a witch. Anyway, thoughts, comments, ideas? You're right that I don't know very much about 
the fundamentals of Wicca, and that is one reason why I don't talk about it a whole lot. And another reason is the little bit that I do know about it and the, the small amount of experience I have with it suggests to me that it's harmless, that it's not nearly as offensive to my either to my intellect or to my morality or whatever as most other religions are. It seems like something that, and this might sound condescending and I, I don't really mean it that way, but it, it seems like just silly and harmless to me. Wicca seems to me like, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure there's a lot about it that if I really dug into it, I would disagree with. I would say, okay, this is a false claim. This is a false claim. This isn't true. This is, this is silly. This is just nonsense. But, but the attitude of most Wiccans that I've encountered, the temperament of the, uh, of the religion, seems just a much more laid back and peaceful and harmless than most other major traditional uh, world faiths. And so, I, I mean, I, I, I'm okay with it. I don't, I don't really see it as, as worth jumping on or as a threat uh, or anything like that. I mean, like all religions, I, can, I consider it to be... A false religion based on things that aren't true, based on beliefs about things that don't actually happen or whatever. But I don't know a whole lot about it, and what little I do know about it tells me that, you know, it's nothing really worth getting worked up over. Matt Broomfield, Steve, just to play devil's advocate, if there was a god, and he could just will things into existence, but had simply not done so since the age of science, how would you apply your scientific method to proving it? I think your answer to Pokemaster 4555 only works if you assume that God does not exist or that by theists claims that he operates in a way that can be confirmed with the scientific method. They do not claim that, and by its nature the supernatural does not conform to such constraints. Well, if the claim is that God can will things into existence and he's done that before but he just hasn't been doing it conveniently since we invented science, uh, and the ability to test these sorts of things. If that's the claim, I, to me, I don't think the onus is on me to prove that that is right or wrong. The, the person making the claim has to prove that that's a sensible thing to be saying. Um, if you're, if, if you're, let's, let, let's say you're a Christian and, and you're, that's your answer. If I, as a, a skeptic, would say to you, well, uh, how come we haven't had a documented case of a, of a holy miracle since the age of the disciples in the New Testament, how comes the miracles have stopped? And your answer might be, well, because God just stopped working miracles. He just chose to stop intervening in human affairs. Maybe that answer satisfies you. It doesn't satisfy me, because it seems rather convenient. But it's not up to me to prove that, <laughs> that it's an unfalsifiable claim. I can't prove without a shadow of a doubt that God doesn't intervene in human affairs but I don't have to because no one has ever proven that he does or ever did. Cyril B. First off, I love your videos. Keep up the good work. So I'm atheist and I refuse to hide it, but my girlfriend's parents are extremely religious. Her dad is a pastor. She's agnostic, but her parents will pretty much hate me for life if they find out I'm atheist. Being that her dad's a pastor and so deeply immersed in his religion, the question of what religion I am is sure to come up. I've considered saying simply I was raised in a Christian household or something like that, but I'm sure he'd see through that or just ask for more information. I refuse to lie about being an atheist. This is my pickle. Any advice? Definitely don't lie about being an atheist. Don't feel like you have to lie about being an atheist. Um, be open about it. I would say be open about it. Maybe uh, try not to be pushy about it. Um, not not that you are necessarily. I'm just saying, in my experience, I've I'm open about my atheism. My family and my wife's family are all aware that I'm an atheist. But you know, I I don't bring it up if it's not relevant in family conversations. If we're sitting around the dinner table, you know, having a meal, I I it, most of the time it doesn't come up because there's other things to talk about. And I'm not I'm I'm certainly I certainly don't hide it. I'm certainly not ashamed of it. But it just doesn't come up. And, and actually, most of the time, their religion doesn't come up either. We just have other things to talk about. Uh, so that's one thing to consider. Just because you're an atheist and he's a, a Christian and a pastor, it doesn't mean that the, that the subject of religion or atheism has to dominate every single conversation. Uh, I mean, obviously, it depends on his temperament. It depends on how much he likes you 
how accepting he is of you in general, whether or not the atheism is a big deal for him. And look, I have no idea. I don't know you. I don't know the, the father. Maybe he's a prick. Maybe he will, if he hears you're an atheist, he will just completely flip out. I don't know. And in that case, there's really not much you can do. But who knows? Maybe you can be a good example to him of an atheist. Maybe you guys can get to know each other and like each other and find value in each other and you can show him that you can be an atheist and you can believe that God doesn't exist and it doesn't mean you're a bad person and it doesn't mean that if you sit down at his table in his house with his daughter that, you know, his house is going to be struck by lightning. Or maybe it does. Or maybe that will happen and it just means that for you, just like for me, it's time for The Lightning Round. Rapid fire questions, glib and adequate answers. Mark Arangis, I've been watching vids of how they made the Lord of the Rings films. There's literally hours showing how they made the miniatures, made the hobbits and dwarves look so small, generated the armies, made Gollum, the costumes, all that shit. Now everyone knows you don't like Lord of the Rings, but do you at least respect it as a technical filmmaking feat? Absolutely. I have great respect for the technical work that went into the Lord of the Rings films. And I even have some appreciation for them artistically in terms of how they look, the, the way they're shot, the way the camera moves. I think there are uh, there's a lot to admire about those Lord of the Rings movies. I just think they're boring as fuck. Curtis Morrison, what is your favorite YouTuber that does videos on stuff other than science atheism? Also, what do you think of Stargate? Uh, my favorite non-atheist science YouTuber is probably Hannah Hart who does uh, My Drunk Kitchen. I think that's just a hilarious concept, and I think she does great with it. And um, I haven't watched much Stargate. I've never seen the movie. I don't think I've ever seen more than an episode or two of the, the, the various TV shows, and I just don't know enough about it to comment. Super Steelers fan 100. Hey, Steve, as a fan of pro wrestling, I must ask, what is your favorite current wrestler? Bonus question, what about AJ Styles do you dislike? Favorite current wrestler is Daniel Bryan, and I don't dislike anything about AJ Styles. Uh, the question last week was, uh, do I think WWE should sign him, or what do I think they should do with him? And I, my answer was, I don't think they, there's a reason for them to sign him. It's nothing against AJ. I think he's a fine wrestler. I like a lot of what he does. It's just that he's of a certain age. He's not that famous outside of TNA, which has a relatively small audience. And even though he is excellent, there are guys on the WWE w roster right now, and even in their developmental system in NXT, that are just as good, if not better, as AJ Styles and could play the exact same role in the company that he would play. And really, if you've got guys like Dolph Ziggler and uh, Kofi Kingston and Zack Ryder and uh, all these guys on the roster already that could do very much the same shit as AJ Styles does, and you're not doing shit with them, what sense does it make to sign AJ Styles? Bonnie43UK, Steve, question, what's my atheist worldview? I am forever being told by Christians I have an atheist worldview, but I'm darned if I know what it is. What do I, what I do know is that I lack belief in God, but that's as far as it goes, really. Oh, come on, Bonnie, that's not as far as it goes. You, okay, you have no morals, uh, you have no justification for your morality, your life is meaningless, you probably... Uh, only refrain from committing horrible crimes because you fear the, the, the law and punishment and things like that. You, you secretly know there is a God, but you just reject him because you don't want to live under his divine authority. Uh, you're convicted by his love and his grace, and you feel like you're unworthy. And, you know, all the, you know this. You, know, you, know, you, you don't need me to tell you this. You know this. You know all of this. You're a wicked sinner. You're, you're, a, you're in rebellion against the Lord. Amazing Bull Weevil, Steve, what are some of your favorite movies, preferably recent ones, that make extensive use of stagecraft or staging tricks? I'm referring to tricks like in Sherlock Jr., where a character walks into a movie projected in a theater. Um, there are lots of examples of little things like that. Actually, uh, Mark, in his question about uh, Lord of the Rings, the Lord of the Rings movies, even though I, they're not my favorite movies at all. They do have a lot of really cool stagecraft camera trick like things like the, the forced perspective to make the hobbits look small compared to the the, the humans uh, without using a CGI effect. Uh, I think there was uh, in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind they did a similar effect when Jim Carrey was remembering himself as a child 
Uh, instead of like digitally shrinking him down underneath the table, they just built a, a supersized table for him to crouch under so he looked like a baby. Um, there are little things like there's like uh, in the uh, one of the flashback scenes in Superman Returns when Clark is remembering when he was a child and he first discovered he could fly. They used uh, there was a, a shot of like his glasses falling off and the glasses were in the foreground and he was like floating in the background and uh, if you watch the making of documentary you realize that the glasses were actually humongous and they just made the glasses extra large so when they put them in front of the camera you'd have that extra long forced perspective that's a couple examples there are a lot, there are actually a lot of really cool uh, modern films that that use practical effects uh, Christopher Nolan loves to use practical effects as often as possible JJ Abrams uses practical effects and camera tricks to suggest things uh, as opposed to digital effects as often as possible. Ray John H. Christians say we, atheists, cherry-pick bad things from the Bible to discredit them. Personally, I think there are more bad things than good, but they bring up good things and shove them in my face. I personally don't care how much good Hitler did. The Bible is supposed to be the best book ever by far, and the fucking thing makes claims on the first page that can be proven wrong. Do you think atheists cherry-pick bad things from the Bible? No, and I don't think we have to, and I think it's just the other way around. I think that Christians and people who defend the Bible, particularly people who have a literal interpretation of the Bible and wish to defend, I think they're the ones that are cherry-picking. They pick out all the stuff about love and brotherhood and forgiveness, and they just either tell us to disregard or they come up with some crazy rationalization to come up with, you know, why it's okay that God drowned the whole world. Or, or killed the firstborn children. Or I mean, I think that to me is a lot more obvious cherry-picking than an atheist supposedly cherry-picking the bad bits. Turn a page in the Bible and try not to run into one of those bad bits. McFly88. Steve, did you ever get bullied in third grade by immature and insecure classmates calling you things like wussy boy and limp dick? Uh, no, I was never called those things until I was an adult and I started participating in the internet. English, not British. Controversial one for you, Steve. With your obvious dislike of all things Dixie, how much does it bother you that the Hagerstown Sons, I got curious about the hat and looked it up, are relocating to Fredericksburg, Virginia? I'm actually happy for the Sons. Uh, my feelings about Southern culture notwithstanding, Fredericksburg seems like a really nice town. And importantly for the Suns, they seem to really want the franchise and care about the team. And the government and the people seem very excited and very happy to be having the Suns moving there. So I say good for the Suns. And, um, you know, too bad. Shame on Hagerstown for letting them go and for not giving a shit about their own professional team. That's what I think. Melvin Carter, do you think the Undertaker's streak should end? Why and why not? And if so, who do you think should do it? No, I don't think it should. I think he should retire undefeated from WrestleMania. Uh, I can't think of anybody right now who could do it and would benefit enough to justify ending it. I mean, at this point, it's been going so long. If they let it get to maybe 10 or 11 or 12 and then they decided to have someone end it, I, that would have been different. But now, I mean, he's up over 20. What's the point? People don't, the fans don't want to see it ended. The, the benefit of ending it is far outweighed by the benefit of just continuing it until the guy retires. No, it should, I don't think it should end. Jason Brunet, Steve, what are your thoughts on butts? Well, Jason, I like butts just fine. Just fine. Hey, that's it for the questions. Before I get out of here, I want to do a shout-out, and the shout-out this week goes to a richly deserving channel that is uh, starting to find an audience at long last and very well-deserved, but it can always have a bigger audience, and hopefully we can help them out. The channel is The Bible Reloaded. That's right, fellas. It's your lucky day. Here's your shout-out. The Bible Reloaded is an awesome channel. These guys, uh, Jake and Hugo, do uh, a series of uh, really funny videos where they either look they look at biblical stories or they have a really great collection of videos about chick tracks where they read and make fun of chick tracks and it's almost like mystery science theater where they read and they sort of act out the the story of the chick track but they also add their own commentary and throw in some jokes here and there and it's just hilarious and it's a really great channel and so much fun and they're to me 
there there's the, those guys there's Bob Smearfact there's dark matter there's there's all these guys who are doing atheist stuff doing religious commentary religious criticism but in such a funny enjoyable entertaining way they're just awesome at it so if you haven't subscribed to the Bible Reloaded check out their stuff and subscribe to those guys because they're absolutely awesome excellent channel that's it for this week I will be back to do this again next week provided of course that you guys ask me some questions that I can answer because of course in order for me to do one of these videos you have to ask so leave a comment on this video ask me anything about anything for next week I will answer as many of them as I possibly can and I'll see you next week take care